Hello, everybody, and, and thank you. Welcome to the show, and thank you for attending our seminar on getting into the hobby. I uh, just to confirm if it, you know what we're talking about is getting into the hobby of pinball machines and arcade games. So, uh, hope everybody's having fun and playing games. And as the rest of our f uh, of our, we have one more person on our team headed up this way. Uh, I'd like to thank my team for making it here, especially because all but one of us were at lunch shortly before this, and they didn't really want to service our food in a timely manner. So everybody rushed over here to be here. So thanks for everybody on the stage. Um, as far as getting into the hobby, uh, what's really important to, to know is all everybody up here, you see all these orange shirts who are working on the machines, keeping them live at the show. Uh, everybody here started off at one point thinking, wow, wouldn't it be cool to have a pinball machine or an arcade game at home? I wonder if I could do that. And I remember I talk, when I talked to my wife, it was like, yeah, I know this guy at work who has one. It would be kind of cool. And, and it started out, went from there to, well, yes, you can. And from there, then it's a, well, you know, I have one machine, well, two would be even better. So if I get tired of paying the one, I can have two. And just so you know, they're like really expensive rabbits. So they will reproduce. You end up with a lot of them and it's, it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun. So in looking at, at getting into this, sometimes it's, it's one of the things to look at is if you're looking at a pin versus a video games. And, and as I go through some of this, what I'd like you all to start doing is thinking about different questions you might want to ask because we're, the goal of this session is to go through and answer your questions and to basically pr help you with what inf whatever information could help you know what you want to do with the, with the hobby or help you get into it. So please think of any questions or anything you might want to know and uh, we'll go from there. So one of the things to think about is pins versus video games. Um, as a high level, pr although prices of course are always go up on everything, the reality is that pinball machines usually cost a little bit more than video games. There are of course exceptions to that. There are some super expensive video games and there are some pins that are a little less expensive. Um, and But a lot depends on what the nostalgia, what nostalgically speaks to you. What are you going to enjoy? What do you really want? And that's a great place to start. The other thing to look at, look for with something like this is, where do I find them? And we can, we'll all probably talk about, when, with, based on what people want to know, some of how we find them. But just so you know, coming to an event like this, there's a board back there that has things listed for sale. As you've gone on the floor, you've probably seen machines listed for sale, and that's a good chance to know that, hey, it actually works. If there's any ch you know, issues, you get to go through and, and, and check them out and try them out, and chances are talk to the owner, because ch the owner of most of those games out there is, is in here, and to look at you know where to go through and, and look. The other option is looking on Craigslist is usually, is, we, we've all found games on Craigslist. It's hit and miss. Uh, the biggest challenge though is to uh, probably avoid eBay. Everybody I know who's bought a game off eBay has, I'm not gonna say everybody's regretted all of them, but anybody here had good, ha, been really happy with an eBay deal? Okay, so we know, of all of us, and no, we've been doing this one. One? Okay. Not one that still had a bunch of quarters in it. Ooh, <laughs> sweet, okay. <laughs> So yeah, it's just eBay is typically overpriced, games that are destroyed. Um, you can make, you all know with cars, you can photograph a car that's pretty rough to make it look good. People can do the same with pins and video games. So, so there, that's something to, to consider. Um, one of the other, th other things is to, the, to go through and look at, um, how do I, if you have a game, it's going to have an issue that needs to be addressed. So one of the things to look at if you decide that you want to have a game at home, which once again, all of us are recommending it and we're all, we are, we are all addicts. We are, we're here to admit that. Um, but when you're looking at finding help to keep it going, there are actually some really good, good groups and good folks in the area for going through and taking care of that. In looking at keeping a machine going, the one thing you don't want to do and where Craigslist is bad is do not go on Craigslist and answer the, the question of the person who says, we'll fix your pinball machine or arcade game. Who, yeah, as people are laughing. That person does not want to help you fix your pinball machine. They want to show up, tell you it's broken, and hey, for like, uh, I won't charge you to haul it away. And it's not quite that bad, but seriously, it's a, they want to pay you pennies on the dollar for what your machine's worth by telling you it's broken. Take your game, fix it, do a little, as little work as possible, and flip it and make the money, make money for themselves. So that's their only goal. So here there are um, 
our folks that go, there are different groups that you can go through and check with and post things online. One of the best things to do is to join, there's a couple local organization groups. There's the, the uh, Washington WPC group, which is Washington Pinball Collectors or Washington Crazies. Pinball Crazies. Yeah, yeah. So there's the WPC group, and uh, that's something that is, isn't WPC Yahoo or Google? Yahoo? It's Yahoo? Okay. I always forget. And then there's the SMAC group, S-M-A-C, for Se Seattle, Metro Area Seattle Metro Arcade Collectors. That's a Google group. I'm on both. I honestly, yeah, they send stuff to my email. That's why I just don't recall which is which. So the SMAC, Seattle Metro Arcade Collectors, or SMAC, is a Yahoo group. WPC is, I'm sorry. You're backwards. Sorry for backwards. SMAC <laughs> is a Google group. WPC is a Yahoo group. And in that group, it's a lot of the local collectors and enthusiasts, and you can post questions, and, and folks will go through and help you. And what really got me into this hobby was because I got my first pinball machine. There's a person who's, one, who's wearing an orange shirt, orange shirt in there who I called this guy out of the blue because somebody said he knew about machines, and he, was so, he took over an hour just talking to me on the phone through fixing something just to be helpful. So that's essentially what kind of got me into it, is I could keep the machine go. I got a machine, I could keep it going with people's help, and the fact that the people who are doing this for a hobby are super helpful and generous with their time. As an example of that is all the machines in there are from people's private collections. There's a few from vendors that are for sale, but I mean, they're almost ver like say pretty much all those machines are from, from private collections. None of us get paid. Nobody involved in this show gets a nickel, as you, most of you are probably aware. No, this is a, a nonprofit group. Everybody volunteers their time. They volunteer their games. And that's because it, it, the, it, this goes to both get people interested in the hobby, but also to promote um, any of the, the money that comes in from the group that's left over goes to create college scholarships for students. So it's just it's a, it's a fun group of people to get to know and and we'd love to more, for more of you to be involved with this so you can bring your games to the show and help out and be part of the community so with that being said that's the overview of yes you can get in the hobby find the right people the people at the show are great people to ask about it and at this point like say since we're here for you and i you know one of the questions i have is essentially what is what questions do you have? What would you like to know, or what can what can we here tell you to help get you involved in the hobby? Yes. Oh, just like mod. Oh, there's a microphone down on the floor right over there. Yep. Get it together, mod. <laughs> Yeah, and I appreciate folks waiting for the mic so we can def all hear your question. For your first machine, do you hold out for what you know will be like your unicorn, or do you just pull the trigger and buy one that's in your price range? Who wants that? I think it's a little of both. It's a little of both because you're going to have a group of games that you want. So you kind of look for those and say, okay, I want to spend this much, but my unicorn is this, and it's going to cost me $3,000. So you kind of look at it both ways. What are you looking for? Oh, oh. This is it. So for asking the first question, because we believe in bribery. If, <laughs> if I don't get this to you, somebody please. Okay, you can deliver. So deliver. <laughs> no, please don't throw it. <clears throat> now we... We're not going to have shirts for every question, but we, we really do encourage questions. And once again, having... Uh, yeah, and once again, bribery is always helpful, and we want this to be interactive. We want people to have fun. When, when buying a machine, are, any, are there any red flags we should look for to just walk away from it? Water damage. Water damage. Water damage. Um, it just, it all depends really on your skill set though. If you haven't owned a machine before, I would say you're looking for a game that is in really good shape. Unless you want to dive into doing repair. Um, and there's kind of two schools of thought. I think there's a lot of people that are looking for a game that has not very much wear. Um, but they can handle the electronics or they're more comfortable replacing the electronics. 
Um, and there's people that want a working game from day one and aren't so worried about the artwork being like on a pinball machine, a little worn at the cabinet of an arcade game, having a bunch of dings in it. I think, uh, I think it kind of depends. Wow, that's loud, isn't it? <clears throat> so I think it kind of depends on what you're good at. So if, uh, you know, like Dan was just mentioning, um, if you have, uh, there are some people that, that don't want anything to do with fixing them. They love them, and that's okay. We, we need those collectors too. But understand, it's gonna cost you a lot of money, right? Because somebody's gotta fix them, and they are gonna break. They're 30, yeah, 40 they're years cheap. old. They're not cheap. So you may get a cheap machine that you spend you know, thousands of dollars on over the years to keep going. So most of us that are, you know, we'll call them conversationally uh, uh, experienced with the games, did so out of necessity. Right, because they're broken and we, we've got to fix them and we're not going to pay somebody else a hundred bucks an hour to fix them. Um, it's, it's literally as much as or more than paying for your car to be fixed. And so if you're good at body work, right, and then the cabinet might not be that bad to you if it's beat up. Um, if you are good at, elect if you have, by good I mean if you have an aptitude for it or you're interested in that area. You may not be good at it right now, but if you have an interest in it, sometimes that's enough. Uh, but ultimately, you. If you go with a game that's, uh, you said red flags was your question. Swelling, a lot of people, if you've got a big swelling cabinet, so water damage as was talked about, uh, it, it, that's gonna have to be in most cases cut out to, to remain, right, or the cabinet's gonna fall apart. And so, uh, a lot of times I'll open up a cabinet and um, again, depending on your aptitude, <clears throat> if it's hacked together, if there's wires that are literally connected everywhere, if there's, uh, Charring a lot of places, that's a big one. Um, but, a mouse nest? Uh, or a rat's nest? Rat, rat's nest, uh, to include the, uh, the remains of said rats. Um, those, we've all found those in the machines, so um, they don't necessarily scare us off. I, none of us, I don't think they scare us off, but they certainly make us look a little deeper, right? Rats like to chew on things, they like to eat stuff. Uh, so ultimately, uh, that's what you're gonna have to worry about. Hey, is this one a little better? Good. Okay, well, I guess this one's a little better. Yeah. So, we, in fact, we were just talking at lunch about that very the uh, the fact that no, we have we were talking about finding the remains of previous occupants of the cabinet. Uh, none of us have found live rodents in the cabinet before. So, like I said, when you're talking about what's the red flag, no, even that, most things like that, you it depends on what they've chewed up, how bad it is. Um, the only time I've ever looked at a at a pin and just been like, no, walked away, looked underneath it all the mechanisms were rusted. And in all the years, uh, I've been doing this a long time, that's the only time I've seen that. And I looked at it and it was a game that I, I'd been wanting for a long time. I ended up finding what took me five years to find another one. But yeah, that was one where it was, no, I'm not gonna replace every single mechanism on the entire every machine. Exactly, yeah. and you know, the other one too is that, who's heard it's just a fuse? Right, uh, sellers sellers love saying it's just a fuse. If it was just a fuse, they would have fixed it. Oh, I don't know anything about these with fuse. Ninety nine percent of the people within the age of Google and YouTube and everything else like that, if it's just a fuse, almost everybody's going to at least take the time to check it because, or you know, it's not a fuse. It's, not a fuse. it's I think most of us will tell you that we've had it. It does happen. Uh, it's rare in in. In literally hundreds of games, you may come across one that is no kidding, literally just a fuse. And they've had two, and it's been, but you've been like a thousand games, right? So. Okay. Oh, okay. You now know why I work with pinball machines and arcade games instead of sports. So, question. Um, so, Repeat the question. so the question was, how hard is it to learn to maintain them on your own? Um, we always mentioned the Google being out there. There's a lot of resources online, but the community here is really, really generous with their time and with their knowledge. Uh, with the caveat that you are actually looking to learn and not looking to drop your machines off and have somebody else fix them. Um, I'm, my wife and I are relatively new to the hobby, maybe just the last four years, um, four or five years. Um, and everything that we've learned is more or less just from like meeting people here and just people being really generous with their time and knowledge. So. Get to know Victor Tan. <laughs> <laughs> we
We we also host repair parties, especially leading up to the show. So like probably about a month and a half ago, I had, I hosted one in Ballard in Seattle. Um, and just invited everyone to bring their full games or their monitors or their boards and we lay out a bunch of tables and um, have a bunch of tools and people can teach you how to work on your own game which is fantastic so um, I want to add to uh, to the repair parties th- stuff with Dan I will go to those repair parties I will help you but when you go to those repair parties you have to be prepared to bring your game a lot of issues are game specific and I can't tell you what it is until I help you trace the wire through or whatever else. If you don't want to bring your games to those repair parties, they ain't going to get fixed by themselves. You need to, and you need a vehicle to transport them. And the other piece to this is that, uh, and I'll get right with you, sir. Uh, the other piece to these is that um, don't, I can't overstate, you've got to be willing to fix it yourself, right? If you're going to come to a repair party or you want folks to help you, um, we are, all of us will donate all of our time that we have. Uh, repair parties are great. You transport your game. <clears throat> Excuse me, allergies are killing today. Um, you transport your game and uh, people help you fix it. Literally, you know, the knowledge is all there. Sometimes the parts are there. You'll end up having to pay to reimburse them, but you know, they, you don't know what parts you need. You're brand new. But a lot of times the parts are there and, uh, and folks will give their time, but you've got to be willing to, uh, to put in the time to fix it yourself. Uh, if not, then honestly, then you're going to, then somebody's going to tell you, okay, you can pay me to fix it for you and I'll do that. But uh, we're not going to donate our time so that you can, you know, so that you can take advantage. Because other folks, to be quite honest, over the years have help you fix your game, and then next day it's on Craigslist, you know, and um, and that happens all the time, unfortunately. What'd you have, sir? I'm sorry, we can't. Seventy six Bally, if I heard correct, right? So you have a seventy six Bally, and you're looking for a good place to find parts. So I'm going to pass. We we all have our own, but there's a couple of good places. But uh, Vic, you probably have some good ideas. Well, Marco, there's there are several places, uh, but uh, over there, Marco Specialties, they have a, a little table over by the new games. They brought a lot of the the new games that people, most of which people have bought that for the show. But they have a table there. But Marco is very good. There's a place out of Poughkeepsie, New York, that the guy's rough around the edges, but he's super helpful. But it's called the Pinball Resource. Yeah. They have a lot of really good stuff. Um, there is Pinball Bayer, Life. Yeah, Pinball Life. Uh, they, there's Bay Area Amusements. There's, did they change their name? No, they, they're still there. Bay, so Bay no, Area Amusements. I can't, sorry, I can't. Yeah. Okay. Um, another place when parts are out of stock is to post on Pinside. Pinside is the largest pinball forum. Um, and a lot of people have stockpiles of, of So stuff. one of the other things too is, uh, and again, we're not, I don't know, what is with me? We're, we're not, you know, it's not like we make any money off of the group, right? It's not how it is. But, but the benefit about joining the group is the fact that uh, there are so many various collectors that, uh, you want me to put it up higher? Is that better? Okay. I'm afraid I was getting feedback. Uh, there's so many different collectors of everything that you're most likely going to find somebody that's got the part that you need, or more importantly, will know somebody that's got the part that you need. So I know that wasn't your exact question. You're like, hey, can I call whatever.com and they have my part? Um, and you just heard Brian give you a few of them. Uh, Pinball Re- for early stuff, they're mostly Gottlieb, but Pinball Resource has a good bit of Bally stuff as well. Uh, but again, I would uh, I can't stress enough the group. Uh, and the reason I tout it so much is because I, you know, I've been collecting now for about 12 years. I moved here. Uh, 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, and and I had about a dozen games, all of them broken. Um, well, all of them broken shipment and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I ended up selling most of them. I didn't know the group. I wasn't going to spend, you know, hundreds of dollars to, to fix games I spent a couple hundred bucks on. And so I literally just started getting rid of them and looking for other ones that worked, right? How many of us do that? Let's find a game that's actually working so we don't have to work on it. And uh, met the group, and now here I am, you know, 11 years later fixing them, and it's uh, it's a fantastic resource. After you sweated a few pipes. The, the, the only <laughs> thing that I would add to that is, um, as you mentioned, a lot of these parts, they, they go out of stock. They'll, they'll come back into stock, but some of them that are really hard to find, you'll find some of the collectors 
will stockpile them. Like they'll see that and they'll be like, oh, last time I was looking for one of those, it wasn't available. And they'll buy like three or four of them. And, and it's not so much for their own use, it's so that other people, if you're asking in the community, they'll be like, oh yeah, we, we know people that have uh, like multiple copies of Playfields for games they don't even own because once they stop making them, they, they stop, yeah, they're not available, so. You don't want to see our garages. <laughs> no. <laughs> And, and one thing that when they mention the community that is super helpful, I've had cases where I, there was one time I needed a game fixed. I had a bunch of something going on that night. So I sent something out saying, who's got this? Um, actually, one time I called, I called Patty and, and her husband Dave and I was like, hey, do you have one of these? And he's, Dave's like, well, I do, but it's going to take forever to get there. So, but they knew who that was a 40 minute drive from me had the part so I could go get it. Similarly, there was one time I had a really obscure Atari pinball machine part. I don't recommend, Atari games are really difficult to work on, but uh, for the pins, and they're really heavy. But I had a person I knew from England who had a friend in Chicago who knew that I had this really obscure part. They called me and said, hey, can you sh ship this over to them because they need it right away. I overnighted it and the guy in Chicago got it the next day via the person in Engl England who knew that I had it. So yeah, it, when you when you get in with the community, it, it really sometimes if you need something really quick, frequently somebody will have it. So, oh wait, okay, I'm gonna try to not. No, no Maud, he's right oh. there. I'm right here. I'll take it. I know, but oh. it's part of fun. It's not part of the fun. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I got a few uh, older Gottliebs, and I'm wondering if the team recommends repairing the boards in those or replacement. And if you go replacement, should you go all in one, or are most of them robust enough to withstand more years of service? Victor? Uh, most of my experience is with Williams boards, um, the newer ones, but some of the older uh, Gottliebs and Bally's have newly manufactured boards that are actually better than the originals. Uh, the biggest thing that kills pinball boards is alkaline batteries. Get rid of them. Don't put them on your boards. Um, the board manufacturer that I think Big Daddy Enterprises, he carries a lot of Rotten Dog boards. K's Arcade, he's another one that carries a lot of boards. Those are the places I would look. Um, if you want them repaired, I think that's a crapshoot. I, I know a guy who had a Williams Power Driver board repaired. I took one look at it and this is like, this was not repaired. And I undid all of the work and redid it. So uh, it's a crapshoot. I can't tell you who's going to be good or bad at that. Board? The which, sorry? The Janet boards, the all in ones. I, I'm not familiar with those boards. So, I, so. So, so the all-in-ones, there are a couple of all-in-ones available, and with via dip switches, et cetera, you can switch it to whatever game you want for Gottlieb, right? Uh, and uh, they, they, they do work. They do replace in many cases, uh, uh, and there's a couple different kinds, right? So some will replace all the boards, uh, one in particular, and then there's a couple that will replace a couple of the boards, right? Um, and the answer is they work. Yes, they do. Um, and they can help you iron... They can help you get over if you have some other issues in the in the cabinet itself, right? Uh, but they're not necessarily going to be a fix-all if you're not sure that the board is the problem, right? So I would make sure that you know that the board is the problem. Uh, I agree with Victor with respect to fixing boards. There are some folks that fix boards great. Um, many people that fix boards uh, fix them to the least extent that they have to. So they are going to get a board working. That's what you paid them to do. But if you've got five components that look bad and the board works when it, gets, when it leaves their bench, then that's what you're going to get. And, and that's the problem you run into when you get people that fix, not all, there are several good ones, but when you run into people that fix stuff. And it's not necessarily a bad thing on their part. They could spend all day replacing stuff that they don't know is bad, right? If the board runs and it works and it didn't work when they got it, then, you know, success. But in your case, it's not going to have the longevity that you want. So uh, for a few hundred bucks, and the $299 to $399 is about what you're going to pay for those, for those Gottlieb replacement boards, right? Um, and, and they absolutely do work. But so again, it's, it just depends on if it's a game that you really want. You know, unfortunately, many of those games that you're talking about aren't are worth 500 bucks, right? And so it's, you've got to make that decision at that point. And when it comes to repairing boards, I'm in the favor, uh, rather than having something like all the different boards replace or put on one board, isolation is a problem. And you're talking about with coils firing, things like that. So personally, I prefer to, if it came with things on separate boards, personally, I prefer to keep them on separate boards because that, that helps with isolation of some of the issues. 
Um, now, as far as re boards being repaired, though, there's on the in the venue. If you walk in the doors, go to the right-hand wall and down. There's a guy. His name is Rob Anthony. He's he does a lot of board repair. He does a really good job with board repair. I personally, I have a, a pinball 2000 machine where the board is having problems. I personally brought one of my boards to the show to drop off with him so he can repair it. So if you have a board that you think might need to be repaired, you can go get his card. You'll send it to him. He has a backlog, like everybody who's good at their work, does good work. But if you have something you think might need to be repaired, if you can't find a replacement, which with my board they don't make one, then it's definitely worth going through and, and having it repaired. But someone like that is a good, reliable person. I just wanted to add as well, new boards aren't always necessarily better. Correct. There's compatibility problems. And some boards, uh, you just can't get a replacement for what we call unobtainium. You, you, you have to repair your old board. So in that case, choose your repairer very wisely. Questions? Yeah, I was just curious how you all got into collecting like, what your first game was and then what your favorite one is. So I was a kid in the 80s that went to arcades all the time. Um, and I'd always sit out in front of the arcade with my friends and like eating our Slurpees and go, wow, someday I want to own an arcade game. Um, and I, that, the, yeah, that dream was in the back of my head. And then sometime about 18, 20 years ago, I went to a party at this house with a bunch of uh, skateboarders, and they had three arcade games in their kitchen. I was like, geez, you can own these? I didn't even think about it. Uh, and I immediately, at, at that time, it was the Little Nickel was the classifieds. Um, so I immediately went to Little Nickel and started just looking at all the ads, and the next week I bought my first arcade game, which was this crappy fighting game called Vigilante. Uh, and it was just a jam up, beat em up, uh, two player game. Uh, I paid way too much for it, uh, but it just sparked it. And then I was looking in the classified ads all the time and, uh, and online and found other local collectors and started, got my first pinball machine, and it just, went on and on um, yeah it is an addiction so be very very careful I have over a hundred machines and how did you first get into it husband he got one before we got married and yeah that's all she wrote zookeeper so I can share my story. Basically, the last year that the show was in Seattle, um, I, at my office, there was a flyer up on there. It was like, oh, Pimble and Arcade Show. It's like, much like Dan, I wasted my youth in arcades, putting quarters into machines, and fell in love with the machine. It was whirlwind at the time. And maybe 20 something years later, I just rediscovered this thing. And it's like, oh, so I went to the show, blown away, didn't talk to anybody. The next year, they moved it down here to Tacoma. I walked around the floors. Someone had a machine open, and I just started a conversation with him, much like the questions that you're asking here. And um, the guy said, oh, yeah, I know a guy who's selling a whirlwind. And he walked me over to him, and that was my first machine. And when I picked it up from the guy, he said, you know, they don't like to be alone. <laughs> And uh, sure enough, four or five months later, they had multiplied. And four years later now, they have multiplied exponentially. And I'll leave it at that. So I, uh, I, I grew up same, same, going to the arcades. But to be quite frank, we didn't come from a lot. And so I spent a lot of time watching other people play games while I put in a quarter every now and again. And I stunk, so they didn't last very long. Um, so again, 20, 30 years later, uh, mid-30s decided that uh, I was at a place in life where I could have what I couldn't have back in the day and I was surprised at how affordable they were now this was again about 12 years 12 years ago so they're a little they're, they go up and down it's like anything else right it's cyclical uh, but my first game was a uh, an absolute crappy I think it was a Sega Batman uh, JAMA game I think uh, it was horrible uh, but it was an arcade game and it was in my house and it cost like 300 bucks and um, 
you know, surprisingly through all the other ones that I ended up going through, uh, that Batman lasted. It, it, it didn't crap out, so to speak. It stayed for a while, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's the first one I've got. And then, Why is it that crappy games never die? I, exactly, right? It's like you can't kill them if you want to. But, uh, um, or sell them. Yeah, exactly. Or, <laughs> or sell them. But yeah, so now here, I mean, I, we've all gone through our different sets, but I think at, at the height I had about 25, 25 arcade games and a handful of pinball machines. So uh, less than several collectors up here, but from one to 25 and you know, a handful of years is, like I said, it is an absolute addiction uh, once you get started. Oh, we have the same game, so you go ahead. Um, so I got into, I grew up working in a bowling alley. I was a punk kid, uh, loved Street Fighter, really wanted a Street Fighter game. Um, so I bought a cabinet, uh, found it on Craigslist. Yes, I do, on Craigslist. Um, just the cabinet, though. Just the cabinet. It was a snowboarding game, and I converted it into a, a MAME arcade so I could play hundreds of video games, um, or thousands. And, just, and then just recently got into pinball. Um, well, I was playing pinball as a kid, but recently started getting into collecting it by coming to shows, asking questions. I actually signed up to volunteer as a transportation. And then when they started setting up the pinballs, just kind of abandoned that part and started learning and talking to people. Um, one thing I will say about the, the pinballs, they talk about it being an addiction. And I can remember sitting in a room like this and listening to people talk and thinking, like, that's crazy. Like, who, who starts, like, getting addicted to these $1,000 machines, the space constraints, like, moving them around but once you start looking into into getting these games you make your list you make your wish list of what you want because they're really hard to come by and maybe if you're lucky you find one you find it in good condition and you're great you bring it home you set it up and then you know maybe six months later one of those items comes up in your list and you realize in the back of your head you're still looking for that list like that whole list and then we went from like one game to getting her my recommendation is, is that you set a limit and you don't pass it. Because once you pass that limit, it's, <laughs> there's no going back. And it just gets, pardon? When did you pass it? Well, I, originally I said no more than three in the house. We have twice that many right now. Um, so if you're going to set a limit, make it firm. So, and don't pass it, because once you go past it, there is, there's really no coming back. But, but, but her limit seriously went from, I, I asked, we, she agreed to get a pinball machine. She said, okay, but one. And I, it wasn't even a minute later. She goes, maybe two if we find a good condition Adams. Yeah, so just for like arcade games, right? I, I, would you recommend going the route of just finding like a random cabinet and doing like the whole main thing? No. Okay. Uh, somebody made the comment here earlier today. There was somebody who was up on up here at one point brought up main games in a previous similar presentation. They're like, "Ooh, I'm not going to do that again." So the reality is, if I know people who have say ten arcade or say half a dozen arcade games and a main game. When they have a party, the main game does, even for non-arcade people, main game ends up not getting played at all. So if you have room for one game and you like arcades and you want to be able to have a few so you can't do that, um, it, it, there's, a, there's a place for it, but the actual original games are just, all, every, there's so much more fun. There are, and it's, there are, it's just something with that authenticity. So I'm, I'm going to, as you probably guessed, I'll go against the grain. Um, I, I don't own a main machine, but like many of us, I started out with one. And uh, I loved it, and it was great. And I built the control panel first, and I spent about six months playing the control panel hooked up to a TV without ever making the cabinet uh, or ever buying a cabinet because I didn't think, at the time, I didn't think to you know, cruise Craigslist and just get an empty cabinet. So I ended up building my own um, after I had built the control panel. So about two years later, I actually had a main machine. And I played it all the time. I really did. It was great. When, and you you know, I didn't have any, and I can't say that one would be chosen over the other because I didn't have any real arcade games, so to speak, dedicated. But I had the main machine, right? Big monitor. It was great. And at parties, it was the life of the party. Everybody wanted to play it. They could play any game they wanted. They could scroll through you know, with the front end and, and play any game they wanted. So it is good for what it is. Um, but there is one thing that is without question, and that is that the original ones play so much better. They just do. I mean, there's a difference between, there's a reason why Miss Pac-Man has leaf switches and not micro switches, right? I mean, it plays differently. 
Um, and so when you when you use MAME, the difference is, again, it's easy for us to say, oh, no, you want the 50 games that you want or whatever. But the truth is, is sometimes you just want to play a bunch of different ones, right? It's why 60 and ones are so popular. It's also space. Seattle here, Tacoma here. I mean, how many people have 5,000 square foot houses or 3,000 square foot houses? Some, but most of the time it's a smaller house. You can't fit 20 games. So do you want one or do you want 20? So I will say the same as everybody else, which is that I don't own a MAME machine anymore. I have only dedicated and I love the dedicated and I don't know that I'd ever go back to MAME. But as a stepping stone or as a learning or as, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, learning a little bit of electronics, even though it's not ex it's not a one for one, right, but how to hook up stuff and th there's a benefit behind it and it does have its place. Uh, contrary to, you know, it, it's a little four letter word, so to speak, right, MAME? Uh, but, um, Again, I, I had a good experience with it. Matter of fact, I gave my machine to my brother who still, it's the life of every party he ever owns and he's the only game he owns. Um, but that's, that's just my two cents on MAME. And, and to finish off the category with first machine, what my, my story is one of, if you can get your spouse involved with this to enjoy it as well, you're so much better off. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so for us, you know, similar to everybody, you know, love games, thought it wouldn't be great to find one. I found a person who put me in touch with an operator down in Portland. For a while, I couldn't buy a machine within 100 miles. But um, so went through, went down. My first was a Twilight Zone pinball machine. So I looked at the guy said he had all these uh, a listing of machines. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was a Twilight Zone. And so I looked out, needed a lot of work. When it was under the tree, we wrapped it up. Our kids didn't know what it was, even though it was a pinball-shaped box or thing under the tree where we wrapped it. But the other thing that's an advantage with getting the right person, our second machine, I bought my wife a pinball machine for our anniversary, and she was happy about it. I was, ah. I was, I, was, I, 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 I did good. I wasn't in trouble. So I, I, I lucked out on that one. But yes, if you can, if one of you likes pins and the other does not, it's going to be more challenging. So yes, try to involve, and also there are certain games, if there's one game that she liked and I was gonna get rid of, and I was like, ooh, no, no, I, no, don't do that. That's rookie mistake. <laughs> so yes, try to, try to be supportive of your other, your other half, if you have another, another half. Sure. So, I mean, I'll, I'll just go first because I, you know, these guys are going to tell you, and they've got much more experience. Um, again, I've been doing it about 12 years, but I mean, we're talking a lot of years in many cases. Um, you know, Pinside was mentioned uh, as a forum. Uh, it's actually pretty reliable. You, I mean, it's what you you got to realize what you're getting, right? I mean, it's going to be they're not looking at your game, so it's not that they're not useful it's but they're guessing right in many cases but uh, uh honestly while i you know i actually ironically live now in california um and so uh, i fly i take vacation and fly up here every year now to do the show because i moved about four years ago and so now i fly back up here every year to do the show since i've moved away but while i was here the most valuable resource quite frankly was the group um there just there's so many people that have so many different experiences some people are great with wpc some people are great with bally some people are great with a particular video game and so since they're all different uh, that's the most valuable resource from there but from your couch um once you start learning a little bit, uh, you really do start getting to learn where the manuals are and being able to pull the manual and read a manual. I never in my life thought I'd be able to read a manual. I was like, saw people read manuals and I, I was, it was Greek to me. Uh, but surprising with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of understanding, it, it makes sense. And then, then you're kind of, now you're dangerous, right? Because you can actually start figuring out some stuff by yourself. But uh, there, there are some other online resources. But again, I find pulling the manual now and this group initially were probably my two uh, biggest resources. Yeah, my, my biggest resources are Victor Tan over here and her husband. Um, and her husband in particular at repair parties over the year has taught me how to repair games because I just started collecting games and had no idea that they might break. Or <laughs> I was naive, I think. Uh, the, turns out 30-year-old electronics fail. Um, but... Um, along with the local community, and, and that, that's really so much more helpful because they can, someone can look at the game with you, show you how to test. I'm, I need to like see it and physically do it. I can't read a manual. I mean, I can read a manual, but I'm not gonna learn from the manual where I learn from doing it and with people um, telling me it. Um, 
Pinside's great. Um, Kalo V for arcade games, but still, you're just saying what you're experiencing, and a bunch of people are throwing out ideas at you, and a lot of times they're wrong. Um, I find the Facebook groups even a lot worse advice coming out. Um, a lot of people that are more amateur um, telling you what, how it was for them the one time they did it. Um, and these days, there's a lot of good tutorials people are doing on YouTube, um, as for everything. Um, and, and that's great for like doing cap kits or bulletproofing a board, um, where they'll talk you through all of it. And it's people like Dave uh, that have done repairs for 20 years that are doing a whole video all about how to do it. That's fantastic. So I want to add, there's, there's two more resources that you can use online. Um, pinwiki.com and pinrepair.com. Pinrepair was uh, was a site put together by a guy in Clay Harrell. <coughs> Excuse me. He is that still up? He took down a lot of his WPC stuff, but some of the older stuff is up there. The other stuff. I think that Clay's old site has actually been mirrored by a, a, a site in the Netherlands. So if you do or Belgium, you can do some searching. You might find some of old, Clay's old information online. But PinWiki is being actively maintained, um, and it has sections on every kind of machine. Gottlieb, Bally's, WPC, System 11, whatever, Alvin G, it's all there. My way of learning is I'll read something, and maybe about 20% of it might sink in, and I'll read it again, and maybe another 10% might sink in, and I'll read it again, and you get the picture. Every time I go back and reread something, a little bit more sinks in, and a little bit more makes sense. It's like, oh, okay, now I get it. Uh, the other thing I want to reiterate with these guys, um, the, uh, at least in my opinion, Pinside is good, but you have to take everything people say there with a grain of salt. They are very happy to give you their opinion, and it may not be right. It's really important. Don't trust them. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. There is some good advice there. But don't treat it as the gospel. And part of it is there's more than one way to do it. So we mentioned the clay guides, and I printed up a bunch of those, so I've got most of them now. But um, there's Tim Megan, is a, Tim is a, he's got several of the machines that are in there, the old Gottlieb 60s small flipper wedgehead, wedgehead games. And he is probably the preeminent restorer of those games in the country. He and Clay, who has the Clay guides who we're talking about, which is amazing resources, occasionally Clay would say, you would disagree with something. So these are two of the premier people in the country on how to deal with these games, and they sometimes disagree. Now, either one of them could fix whatever the problem is, and it would be great. So that's another thing is, if you some, find something that's conflicting, it may not be that ne either is right or either is wrong. There are sometimes different ways of approaching it. Next question. Sorry. Uh, this, is, this is a concept that was, uh, as a relatively new collector, was introduced to me that I'd like to get your opinion on and, um, and also sort of what your personal value would be on this now that I've set it up. Um, that there is a practical limit to how many pinball machines one person or one family could own that is based on the number that you're able to keep running consistently. Uh, <laughs> and I'm wondering if... Uh, Hogwash. Uh, sorry? <laughs> so I guess my question is, what do you, what do you think about that, that, uh, uh, that notion that there is a practical limit, that the number you can keep running is the most you should have, and what would you say that that is? I see a head shaking, so apparently there's no limit there. We're still looking for it. <laughs> well, well, I'll take the, a stab at that. As someone who owns way more than he probably should, um, <laughs> it really, it, I, you, you hit the nail on the head here. It's how, uh, how well can you maintain them? And your level of maintenance is really your degree to which you tolerate playability. Uh, for me, if there's a broken switch or a, a, a credit dot, I, I can't deal with it. It's just like, I, I gotta fix it. It's gotta work 100%. <laughs> Again, some people say, a credit dot? What the heck's that? I don't know what that is. It, it really depends on you. I mean, if you've got 50 machines and they play 50% you know, reliably or well, you might be happy with that. If you have 10 machines that play 100%, you might be happy with that. It's, it, it's what you wanna make of it. There, there's one other thing, to, and that's as you start getting into the hobby a little bit more, um, deals will come up. 
I'll call them opportunities as opposed to deals, right? Because they're not necessarily deals sometimes, but they're opportunities. So I, I do agree that the answer is you got to, you know, keep an eye out on what you really can take care of uh, to some extent. But the truth is, is that it's not like, uh, with the exception of obviously the new one, Stearns, et cetera, that the, they're not making more, right? All these games are, are there. What you see is what you get. And uh, yes, some come up occasionally in really great condition and you're where you know barn finds so to speak where did i find this right uh but the truth is is when you know the corollary to only get what you know what you think you can take care of is if something comes up and it's on your list or quite frankly it's a good enough opportunity that you could get something on your list from it then my two cents is get it um you know it's you can you can leave it broken down and stick it in the corner and nine out of ten times assuming you did your homework I mean, this isn't something you're going to do on day one obviously most of the time but as you get in the hobby you get more comfortable with what what is reasonable and what because again things just happen people need to leave town people you know not everything on craigslist is is uh, most of it is but not everything is uh, nonsense right um ebay is almost always nonsense has been mentioned right that is that should not be your that should not be your uh, litmus test for for what the price you should pay on something is right um it should not it's but. right for insurance companies. I think the other thing that as you get more machines and as you spend more time around other people that are playing, um, there'll always be people that are willing to offer you space in their home for your <laughs> machines. Um, and when a machine is actually being played, um, in, in a home, it's not going to get that many plays on it, so it doesn't break down as frequently if it's, if it's being used. So a lot of the people here have games in other places. Um, so space isn't so much an issue, fixing them in other people's homes, but if those people are interested and um, aren't going to do damage, then you, know, you also have a little bit of a helper crew. And, and one of the other things to consider is if you have a bunch of games, because I have around 25, one of the things you'll find several of us up here, we don't know exactly how many games we have, it's just within a range, but that being said, I had, um, I always took, kind of, took some pride that I didn't, if I have a game, none of my games had a single error on them. They all worked 100%, and if there were any issues, I would go through and be, have a list of things I want to make them even better. And then I had some significant eye problems that went on for a few years. And I mean, to the point where um, literally could not see well enough to make repairs. And there were people who helped out, which was great. The only reason I kept them going. But I did end up with a, 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 signi a diff way far more games not working that I, than I wanted to. And now I'm, you know, I'm able to go through work on that. But yes, life situations can, change, can happen that can impact your, how many games you have running. Um, as far as the number, although I don't think there's a specific number, I think it's, mine is based on space. So I have to keep, we have people who've been over to our house who have no idea we have games. Then they go downstairs and they realize we have 25 games. So, um, so for, uh, for us, I learned, I learned the hard way, do not have a game that's in the way. That's the, that's the one rule that I kind of have at home, but downstairs, uh, say, we, we just picked up a pinball machine inadvertently. Uh, uh, one of our, at one of our planning meetings, we were talking about a game we wanted, and one of, the, one of the, the planners for our show said, oh, I've got one of those at home right now for sale. We drove to his house after the planning meeting and drove the machine home. So, and my wife, as we're driving home, she's like, where are we going to put this? I was like, nah, I, there's always room for one more, but I'm to the point where I really don't. <laughs> Do, you know, she's a new I, video game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we are at the point where, yes, both my, my, I can try to pretend I always have room for one more, but my wife knows that I'm really kind of pushing that limit. So I want to also add in terms of how many games and agree with Ray that if an opportunity comes up, you should take it. In today's day and age with pinflation, as I like to call it, the way it's going, you look at a pin you could have bought two years ago, three years ago, whatever it is, for 2000 and now it's 4000 Well, if you picked up a game then for 2000 odds are it's increased in price at the same time. And then all you need to do, and this is not a financial recommendation or anything, but all you really need to do is trade the game for another of the same roughly value rating, whatever, like an A for an A or a B for a B. You haven't lost any money, but of course, what you really lost is storage space because you stored the pin for that many years. Yeah. And you that. You've never done that. I would, <laughs> I would never give financial advice or planning <laughs> advice like that at all. Well, and one thing similar to what Victor said, there was some, a game that I wanted to buy and I didn't have the extra money in the toy budget for it. So I took a game that was worth 
about four grand. And there was a friend of mine who said, I tell you, he's like, tell you what, and this is somebody who I trust, I knew he, he, he machine would come back in at least as good a condition. He paid me $2,500 for the machine, and I could buy it back from him for $2,500 any time I wanted. So for him, it was one of those cases where he kind of wanted to try the game out for a while and see if he really liked it. He had it for about six months. And then at the end we did that. But I know other people who have gone through and like who just traded. Hey, let's swap this game for this game for a little while. You swap it for a little while, and and then you swap back. So when you get to know the people in the community, um, there's all kinds of different things, you know, creative ways of of trying out a game for a while. So, so all this really is reinforcing one thing. It's about networking. It's about knowing people. Uh, I can't say that much more than that's what it is. Hey, um, so we keep talking about space limitations. I'm wondering of all the games you've ever collected, are there any games in your collection that would never leave and maybe one yes. that couldn't get out fast enough? Uh, just going left to right, maybe. My first game was a whirlwind. It's the first to arrive, it's the last to leave. And every other game, I don't know, I feel attached to them. The problem with me is that I, I work on them and I restore them and I put all the blood, sweat and tears and labor into them. I just don't want to let them go. That's my problem. It was good having it for a year though. <laughs> I, I think like most, it's uh, usually, I mean, in my case, it's my first pinball. Right? I mean, I had 20 some odd video games. My first pinball was a Space Invaders pinball machine. A uh, piece of crap I bought over in Bremerton for 200 bucks and uh, I paid too much. And um, it, uh, again, it's in the process of being restored and it won't ever go anywhere. Uh, but uh, it's really hard to say that. I, I say that with the caveat of, you know, sentimentality goes so far, but it's amazing how next week or the week after or six months down the line, you find something else you want just that much more. And you really have to think of, is it worth, because you still have the space problems, if, unless, unless you're, you know, Bill Gates, you still got the budget problems. And so you, you kind of got to bounce that back and forth. So right now for me, it's space invaders, but I'll, I'll be honest, I, I can't see it going anywhere, but you just never know what might come out on the horizon that might make me, uh, you know, give that a second thought. Um, if, you, if you'd asked me a year ago, um, I would have said that the new Batman 66 would have been the first one to leave our house, but that was before they did all the updates. Um, and so it's way more fun to play now. And so it's kind of a toss up, but I think you'd be prying that Adams out of my cold dead hands. Yeah, I would agree. The uh, the Adams is um, like one of my favorite my favorite pinball machine, and right now it's in about a thousand pieces while I'm refinishing it. So once it gets back together, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm gonna say th my first pinball machine was the Twilight Zone, and that's just all the nostalgia. I've done a lot to kind of add lots of like cool mods to it, things like that, and just love that game. So that game's not leaving. Bought my wife for our anniversary, the Adams Family. Um, no, I think she'd get rid of me before the game, so, so that, that, that one doesn't go anywhere. And now a recent addition, we have a little um, Miss Pac-Man cabaret that's all fixed up that this person and her husband helped with doing a lot of restore on it. It's got like pink tea molding, it's got all the actual side art from Miss Pac-Man. Super cute, Our, my granddaughter's favorite game, and uh, the only way that would probably go is if she was the only grandchild ever, and she at some point wanted, maybe she could get it from me, but that would be the only way. I've turned over almost all my games. A so, couple to me. Yeah, a couple to you. <laughs> uh, I, the, there's games I think I'm going to keep forever and I will keep for 10 years and then and suddenly I'm not playing it ever and, you, and it's, it becomes trade bait or I sell it to make room for another game. Uh, but uh, there's two pins. And one is Adam's Family, which is what everyone else has said. I picked one up back when they were cheap still. It's in great shape. And I love the theme. I always loved the game as soon as it came out. And it's, it's one that's not going to leave. And the other one is Black Knight from the 80s. And that was a game I grew up playing in the arcades. When I go over to Bellevue to this place called Triple Alliance, where we'd buy our D&D &D lead figures and books. And then they had a little arcade in the back. And uh, um, I was a total nerd. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. Hey! <laughs> um, but they had Black Knight there, and that was, like, the first pinball machine I remember that, like, 
talk some crap to you and add multi levels and multi ball. And these days it seems really old, but at that time it was like pushing the envelope for what modern pinball was. And it still has this little thing in my heart that uh, I just can't get rid of it. My first pinball was the Elvira. I got it which, in a which one? Uh, Party Monster. And I got it when it was in about six boxes and had just been through a fire. But that game will never leave my house and it's a beautiful game now and she runs great. And it doesn't smell like smoke? No, I cleaned that bitch up. <laughs> I, Back when there was that question about what are the things that you would make you walk away from a game, I would say fire. Uh, the smell of smoke is so hard to get out of a game, but both from cigarettes or one that's been in a fire. I bought a pinball machine that had been in a fire before, and it would just had smoke damage on it that wiped up, but I could never get the smell out of it. Awesome. And with what was, I bought awesome one before cleaner. things, laws changed in Washington State that I think had been living in a house that that's all that they did, and yeah, it, it was tough to get out. The cleaner's called Awesome? Yeah. Okay. It actually gets that smell out of there. Huh. And rat piss. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> so we're learning too. We only have time for a couple more questions. Yes. So since we're on the space topic, we're actually um, moving soon to a bigger house, and part of the uh, for more games is that we can fit more games in. <laughs> and um, I was interested in your in the comment that you have 25 games in your basement because we were advised not to put our games in the basement. So I was curious about whether that's an issue or not for you. They said that our games wouldn't last as long if we put them in the basement and that we should keep them above the basement, so now we're turning our living room into do an you, arcade. Do you have any moisture problems at all in your basement? Well, we don't know because it's a new house and we haven't okay. moved yet. So for us, we have a nicely finished basement. Now there's an argument that the temperature, because it's, now ours is a daily basement, so I can drive around, get a game in without going up or down a single step. So that, I have an, a really nice situation with that. But because half of it is covered by ground, the temperature is more stable there. We have carpeting down there, we have no moisture. Uh, so for us, that the moisture is not an issue and the temperature, so I, they probably do better in our basement than any place else. However, if you don't have, if you have a basement and you do, as long as you do not have significant temperature fluctuations, and as long as you have no moisture whatsoever, uh, no problems at all. Ours are in the yeah, yours are in your basement. Yeah. The worst part about having them in the basement, at least at my current house, is steps. If you, I had to rent a, I, I moved about a year ago, and I had to rent a stair climbing dolly to get my pinball machines down, and then there's always. Uh, a chance of damage when you're moving them around. Yeah, my basement goes yeah. straight from the front door. To I, I think the the, I think the uh, many of us, and I was just talking to Victor here off the side. Uh, there's no issues with putting them in the basement, uh, with, with a couple of exceptions, as you've heard. Right? There are some basements that are not finished. They're moist. They're damp. You walk down there, you smell it. it you, you don't want to. Be, that's going to be in your pin, right? You don't want that. Uh, but with few exceptions, if you've got a finished basement whose walls are sealed and the whole nine yards. You know, which I just left my house. I'm now in California, but I just moved a year ago. And every one of my games, I had about 20 at the, actually a little more than 20 at the time. Uh, everything from pins, vids, slot machines, and jukeboxes. And every one of them was in the basement, and it was perfect. There's no issues. So I think uh, I think it's uh, it's it's overkill to say that you shouldn't put them in the basement. It's as long as your basement is a, is sealed or is in, you know is going to be good. You're you're fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the answer was de the answer was dehumidifier in the basement, and what you'll find in almost all basements is you'll run a dehumidifier, even if it's I had again mine was sealed, drywalled, everything. It looked like just another part of the house, but we always ran a dehumidifier down in the basement. It just is part of that. 
So if anybody has any more questions, uh, we can, we're, all of us, we're, we are out of, are out of time for today, but we'll, you can pretty much check with any of us right afterwards. We'll kind of hang out for a few minutes so if people want to go through and get into any more information. And uh, like I said, we encourage, it's, it's odd because I've worked in some places where nobody wants to encourage somebody else to get into the hobby because it's competition. No, we want you to be in the hobby. We, we want you to help out with volunteering for the show and, and helping raise money for the scholarships and being part of the community. Essentially, it's kind of that's that's what brought a lot of you've heard a lot, like the community, the networking, like what Victor mentioned. And so, yes, please check with us if you have any questions. We appreciate you being here and hope to keep seeing you here in the future. And in addition, several of the people with orange shirts who are working on games mentioned how they started coming to our show. Please get into it. Volunteer for the show. Help out. And uh, yeah, we we appreciate you being at the show and being at the at the seminar. So thank you. And. The person who asked the last question, because whoever asked the last question today wins one of our little special, like, little glasses that, that has our logo on it, it engraved on it. Throw it? I'm not, I will not throw the glass. Here you go, Mod. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>